1 Peter chapter 1 today. Let's stand, shall we? You follow along as I start in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corrupt, excuse me, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be administered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord, Jesus, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, the word meet there means necessary. Yeah, I think it meet or necessary, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Father, we thank you again. Lord, for your word today, and I pray that you'll open it to us, give us clearance of thought, direction, Lord, as we, uh, Lord, try to make some sense out of the reading today. Again, we pray for those who could not be here, Lord. Terry told me that Wayne is very sick today, Lord. Uh, he's very, very sick, and uh, Lord, I know that the, some of the Maxims have flu. I believe uh, some of Matt's kids have the flu, Lord. I, no, it's still going around. And so, Lord, we pray for these who could not be here today because of illness. Uh, Lord, there may even be others that we're not aware of. Of course, Lord, we continue to pray for those who are greatly in need of prayer. Uh, Lord, we pray for Earl Ref's wife, Lord, who uh, had pretty much what her husband, uh, septic, Lord, kind of blood poisoning or something, Lord. Uh, she has, so we pray for her. Uh, Lord, of course, we pray for those who are in need who have cancer, uh, Lord, that you would, Lord, touch them. Lord, we have absolutely, Lord, Lord, I have absolutely no doubt that thou art able, Lord, to heal. And Lord, we pray and we ask, Lord, for these that are afflicted with cancer today, that, oh God, you would be merciful and gracious unto them. Lord, bless, we pray, in the few minutes that we have. Lord, time's kind of gotten away from us today. But, Lord, I ask again that you'll open your word. Lord, we pray again that you would save those that may be watching today that know not God. Lord, that have never been saved. Lord, there may be some watching. Lord, there may be, Lord, as we know that many people watch us. Lord, maybe not right now but eventually. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Uh, Lord, for those who are here today that made the effort to come out, though the roads were kind of treacherous, Lord, we pray, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that they made it, and Lord, we're praying for safety for each one of our brothers and sisters home today. And Lord, perhaps there's someone here today. Lord, I don't know. Maybe there's somebody here today that's not sure about heaven. Lord, I remember when I wasn't sure about heaven. Lord, I remember that. Lord, I think back to that. Lord, I remember that. Lord, that's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Really, it's not. Lord, what the shame is is when we do nothing about it. So for those who may be watching, who may watch us, Lord, we pray again today that, Lord, you would save 
Uh, as Oliver Green used to say, save that soul nearest to hell. Lord, we pray. Bless in the few minutes we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. I have to say this quickly. Somebody mentioned this to me um, about healing. I am not a faith healer. In other words, if uh, our dear sister Becky had something wrong with her and she came up here and I'd smack her in the head and knock her over and slay her in the spirit and say, be healed, I can't do that. I cannot do that. And I, people say to me, well, I know so-and-so that was. I'll just say quickly, it's nothing to do with the sermon whatsoever. So um, that sometimes that God heals in spite of people, that God does do that. Um, that God would heal somebody just because he's God, and that God would do that. Uh, I cannot explain everything that happens. Sometimes they're fakes and charlatans. Sometimes the people that get healed weren't really healed. Uh, I'm not a faith healer. But I do believe that the prayer of faith can save the sick. And the, the Bible says this, that if there be any sick among you, and, and I'm not talking about a cold, uh, th look, it, the indication would be, if there be any sick among you, let him call for the elders. This would be somebody who is really sick, who can't, I, I know it's not good English, can't hardly get out of bed. But the proper would be they, they can't hardly get out of bed. They would call for the elders, and the elders would come and anoint them with oil uh, and pray over them. You say, preacher, does it work? Well, the Bible says the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now, this is what I think about that. I believe this about, about faith healing, about praying over those that are, and anointing them with oil, is that, that God would raise them up for service again, that God would do that. I believe that God will. Um, I believe that, I hate saying it least, I believe that God can. No, I say it least, I know that God can do this. I'm not, I wouldn't have any doubt about it. But it is a often misunderstood, often misused uh, thing. Um, but the person has got to be willing to call. They've got to call for the elders and, and then pray, and then pray. We're not praying about the flu. We're not praying about a cold. We are praying that, that somebody who is very sick, I mean very sick, can recover and uh, be healed. Can God do that? Can God do that? Amen. Can God provide a table in the wilderness? Amen. Sure he can. So God can do that. We'll speak about that this morning. Uh, in First Peter, or Second Peter, I'm sorry, where we read, there are so many good things in Second Peter today, uh, in chapter 1, that we could talk about, and I don't really want to take a lot of time with them, but uh, you'll note there that uh, verse 3, it says, uh, according as the divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Look, Everything that I need to live to be a successful Christian in the Christian life, God has given to us. And then he gives a list of things, and he says, besides to your faith, you've got to have faith to be a Christian. Faith in what? Faith that what Jesus did uh, is not only necessary, but sufficient to save us from our sins. Uh, there are many people who think, well, the, the death of Jesus was necessary, but it's not sufficient. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, they want to add things to it. Well, I think Jesus had to die on the cross, but I think you've got to be baptized. Well, I don't know what the Bible says. I think Jesus had to die on the cross, but I think you ought to live a good life. I think you ought to be baptized and live a good life. I, I agree with that. But what you're saying then is that while the death of Jesus was necessary, it is not sufficient because we've got to add some things to it. No, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so he says this, add to your faith virtue. Virtue is character. That's what virtue is. After a person gets saved, they need to get some character about them. Uh, we live in an age where there, people don't have character. Uh, character is, your reputation is what people think you are. You may have a good reputation, that you're a good person, but your character is what you really are. Your character is what you do when, when nobody else is going to make you do it. For example, um, you know, don't want to go to church. 
Who makes me go to church? You say your wife does, preacher. Well, yeah, sometimes, but, but you know, who makes you go to church? Character brings you to church. When my dad got saved, the preacher did not go around and beat on the door begging to come to church. You've heard me say this. The Sunday after my dad got saved on a Tuesday night, on Wednesday, he went to tell the preacher at the church where we were going. We weren't ever coming back there. And the preacher said, why not? Well, we got saved going over there. And the preacher said, well, they don't believe anything we believe. My father said, you're absolutely right. And we will never be back here. And so dad started going to church. Preacher didn't make him go to church, then beat on the door, tried to encourage him to come to church. My dad got saved, started going to Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Wednesday night service, Sunday night service, two-week revival services. He said, well, who, what made him do that? Character. So the Bible says that after a person gets saved, they need to get some character about their life. Then it says get some knowledge. It doesn't say get knowledge and then character. Get some character and then begin to get some knowledge about God. The Bible says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge, 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And then it says other things there about knowledge and then temperance and self-control. Oh, in our life, patience. Everybody needs patience. The way we get patience is if you pray for it, look out for trouble. Because the Bible says tribulation worketh patience. That's what it does. If I know anything about working on a car, there's always one nut that won't come loose. Always. Uh, that will bring you patience. Um, our, our brother is not here, uh, Kyle. Which I remind, I'll remind you about this. Uh, you, if you weren't here on Wednesday night, Kyle was to have back surgery next week. The insurance company won't cover it, and so they're not going to be able to operate on Kyle. So, so pray for him. But if you ask Kyle, um, he, said last, he said to me last Sunday, he said, Preacher, I had every intention of being in Sunday school this past week because I know you were going over Romans. And he said, I was going to be there. And everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And if you're a farmer, you know that to be true. And being a farmer works patience. Either that or you shoot the cow. But anyway, so tribulation worketh patience. Uh, and patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness, charity. Charity is love at work. Uh, you can say, I love you. You can say, I love you. And we ought to say, we love the brethren, which we do. But charity is showing that you love somebody. Charity is helping somebody out. Charity is seeing somebody broke down in the church beside the road and you stop to help them. It's not rolling down the window and, you know, where are you going? I'm through the store. I'll tell them to keep it open until you get there. That's not charity. Charity is, uh, let me give you a ride and I'll call the tow truck and uh, we'll get you out of here. Listen, charity is love in action. You can say you love somebody. And the Bible says the, to do these things and add these things. And, and, and here's an important verse. It tells us that in verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Listen, we can get so far away, we can be so backslidden from God, we can forget that we were even saved. What, what Peter is saying. Now, I want you to notice, though, verses 12, 13, and 14. That's really where I want to get to today. So we've got to move. It says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Peter said, I'm going to remind you about these things. But notice what it says. Though you know them. I know that you know it. I know that you're aware of it. I know that you know about it. But I'm going to remind you anyway. I'm going to remind you about some things anyway. He then goes on to say, uh, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle. Again, yeah, I think it's necessary as long as I am in this body, what is it, this earthly tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. To remember. One of the things about, supposedly about getting old, old age, is that you forget things. One of Pete's favorite lines is, I'll never forget old what's-his-name. Uh, <coughs> and so, you know, we, we get older. We forget things. Two friends walking down the street. Two old friends walking in opposite directions meet each other. Two old friends. They begin to talk to <coughs> one another. And uh, after a few minutes, the one friend says to the other friend, he said, uh, I hate to say this, but I can't remember your name. Would you please tell me your name? And the other friend looked at him and said, well, how soon do you need to know? 
And it's, it's like when we get older, we just have these things about remembering. About remembering. Two old people, husband and wife, go to the doctor. The doctor says, look, the best thing to do is write things down. Okay, write things down. Just write them down. So they said, okay, that's a good idea. They go home and she says to him, I like a bowl of vanilla ice cream. And he goes, okay, I'll go out in the kitchen and, and I'll uh, get you. She said, you better write it down. He said, no, I can remember that. I can remember a bowl of vanilla ice cream. So as he's going through the door, she says to him, I want some chocolate sauce on it. He says, okay, vanilla ice cream, chocolate. You better write it down. No, I can remember chocolate sauce, vanilla ice cream. Then she yells through him as he's in the kitchen, I want a little whipped cream on top. I got it. Whipped cream, chocolate sauce, vanilla ice cream. You better write it down. No, I got it. He doesn't come back for a little while, doesn't come back. She begins to worry a little bit about, the, about her husband. Finally, he comes through the door. He's got grits and eggs and bacon and sausage. And she looks at him and goes, where's the toast? So I'm just saying, <laughs> when we get older, we have a problem remembering things. To remember stuff. And Peter says this, I'm going to remind you about certain things, though I know that you know them. I, I, I know that you're aware of them. But he said, I want to remind you about certain things. And he said, I'm going to try to stir up your, your memory to remember things. And the truth is, the older you get, sometimes it's harder. My brother said something to the doctor one time about he was afraid he was losing his memory, and the doctors looked at him and said, if you think you're losing your mind, you probably are not. Although we talk and we go down memory lane playing, hey, do you remember when? And he said, well, I don't really remember that. But when we get older, we, we tend to forget. And when we're in the Christian faith for a long time, and we, we have been saved for a long time, and there's just certain truths that, that we don't remember or we tend to forget as we go down the road of life. One of the things that we, we fail to re, we forget, that we don't remember. And if I said it to you, you would say, oh, preacher, I already know that. But Peter said, I know that you know it, but I just want to remind you about certain truths. Look, if you would, at Second or 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Let me give you, if I might, in the few minutes that we have, a couple of things this morning. Second Kings, 1 Kings, I'll get it right. 1 Kings chapter 19. See, there you go. 1 Kings, 2 Kings, that's all the kings to me. But 1 Kings chapter 19. You remember in chapter 18, uh, if you don't, I'll just kind of remind you. In 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, there had been a drought, and Ahab had been looking for Elijah for a long time, and finally Elijah uh, shows up and, he says, you know, it's going to rain. And they have this contest on Mount Carmel. Elijah goes up and the prophets of Baal go up. And you'll remember that from the morning sacrifice to about noontime, the, the priests of Baal, they were cutting themselves with knives. They were jumping up and down. They were screaming, begging for Baal to come down to, to consume the sacrifice that was there. Elijah's making fun of them. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe went on a vacation. All those kind of things. Nothing happens. Finally, about 12 o'clock, Elijah says, okay, that's enough. Get out of the way. And so they make a new altar. They, they put stones there. They make a new altar. They put wood on the altar. They put the sacrifice on the altar. And then they dig a trench around the altar. And they pour in barrels of water. And they pour barrels of water over top of the wood, over top of the sacrifice, over top of the stone. Not only once, but I believe that the account tells us that three times that they poured water over top of that sacrifice. And then Elijah prays a 36-word prayer. See, our praying does not always have to be long, but it, Elijah prayed an effective prayer that God would show himself to be strong. And at that moment, the fire of God fell, and it consumed the sacrifice, it consumed the wood, it consumed the stone, and it licked up the water in the trench. We could say it was a small atomic explosion when the fire of God fell because it consumed everything that was there. And then 
Elijah and the guys that were for God killed all the priests of Baal. Now in chapter 19, we read this about Elijah, that Jezebel finds out that ungodly, wicked woman, one of the most ungodly women that is mentioned in the Bible, uh, not quite as bad, I believe, as her granddaughter Athaliah, who killed all the grandsons, but Jezebel was pretty wicked. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, with all how he had slain all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not the li thy life as the life of one of them, by tomorrow, about this time, what Jezebel said was, by sundown tomorrow, you're going to be dead. I'm going to kill you. And when he saw that, he arose and went or ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested it for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay down and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Here Elijah runs from Jezebel. He runs from that woman, that ungodly woman. She said, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. Elijah killed the prophets of Baal, and he said, I'm going to kill you. By this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. You, you, and so Elijah runs. Now, he had just killed 7,000 prophets of Baal with a sword. There had just been a tremendous miracle that had occurred on Mount Carmel. He said to the people, how long halt you between two opinions? If God be God, then serve him. And if not, People said, well, we'll serve the Lord. So Jezebel finds out Ahab runs home. Ahab is, is the, the prototype, prototypical type of a henpecked husband. He runs home and tells his wife. Now, Ahab didn't tell Elijah, I'm going to kill you. He runs home and tells Jezebel, just like Ahab ran home that time, and said to Jezebel, I want Naboth's vineyard, but he won't give it to me. He won't. Now, Naboth could not give it to him because it belonged to his family, and so Naboth could not give him the vineyard. So he, Ahab goes home, he crawls into bed over against the wall and starts crying like a little kid. Jezebel comes in and says, what's the matter with you? Well, Naboth won't give me his vineyard. And she said, well, I'll get it for you. I'll take care of that. I'll get it for you. She set up a bunch of false witnesses against Naboth. They had him stoned. And then she says to Ahab, now you can get it. It's yours. Ahab comes home from the contest on Mount Carmel and said to Jezebel, you're not going to believe what just happened out there today. All the prophets of Baal got killed. Her name is Jezebel. Jezebel. She was a worshiper of Baal. He said, all the prophets got killed out there. She sends word to Elijah somehow that by tomorrow night, you're going to be dead. So Elijah runs to get away from her. He goes, he leaves his... Uh, he goes to Beersheba, leaves a servant there, then goes a day into the wilderness, and this is what he says to God. God, I don't have enough courage to kill myself. So God, why don't you just go ahead and get it over with? You go ahead and kill me. Go ahead and kill me, God, right here. I, I, I'm no better than my father's. Look, just kill me right now and get it over with. But that isn't what God did. He, it says there in those verses there about it, it says this. Let me put my glasses back on. I can't see you when my glasses are on, so I take, keep taking them off. And it says this. He said, God, kill me. And he lay down and slept in verse 5 under a juniper. Behold, then an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And there it says that there was a, a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him again and said, Arise and eat. One of the greatest verses in the Bible, dear Christian friend, is that verse, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for thee. Listen, the journey we're on is too great for us by ourselves. 
Now, here's what Elijah forgot. Paul, Peter says, I'm going to remind you of some things. And so, I just want to remind you, although I know you know this. Elijah forgot how much God really loved him. We go through the Christian life every, and, and there's not a person in the room who doesn't have a problem every now and then. Life would be, you say, well, I wish it were this way, preacher, but life would be really boring if it was the same thing every single day. You never had a problem, never had a care, never had a concern. Life would get pretty boring like that. You say, well, sometimes I wish it was that way, preacher. You don't understand my life. Everything seems to go wrong every day. Sometimes I'll bet you have actually even said, God, why? Why is this happening to me? Why, why? Gideon said that. Why is all this befallen us? If God is for us, how come all this stuff is happening to us? And Elijah fell asleep. Now, we, we've talked about depression in Sunday school many times, and, and one, of the, one of the things that, that doctors say that we, we forget things is because of depression. If you are severely depressed, you have a tendency to forget things. If you're under a great deal of stress, you have a tendency to forget things. If you are very tired, all three of which Elijah had. Elijah was very tired. He was depressed. He was depressed because Jezebel said she was going to kill him. He was um, under stress because he's depressed because he's going to get killed. And who wants to get killed? So he's under stress and he's very tired from the journey. All three things which have a tendency to make us forget things. Elijah forgot how much God really, really loved him. And you and I have problems in life. I have problems in life. Everybody has problems in life. It's like I've said many times, I say to the kids on the bus, he looked at me, everybody's got problems, maybe yours will work out also. I always tell them that, I tell them that probably every day. Everybody seems to have problems, everybody's got concerns, everybody has cares in this life. And tell sometimes we forget how much God really loves us. May I remind you that God knows you by name? God knows you by name. You're not just some, you know, like Social Security. And Social Security, all you are is some number. 718-657-3389. Now, if somebody, my wife says to me, so you've got to be careful what you say. So people watch this. They, I'm just saying this. Did you know this, that on TV, the number always is 555? Because there's no 555 exchange. You want to know why? Because years ago, they would give out telephone numbers on TV, and people would call those telephone numbers up. That was not my Social Security number. So if you're watching and trying to get it, that was not it. But the Social Security, all we are is a number. All we are is some nameless person. But God knows me by name. God knows you by name. God knows all about us. God cares about us. You know how much God cares about us when no one else cared about me, when nobody loved me, when nobody was concerned whether I lived or died, when nobody else in this entire world even knew my name. God did. God loved me. The Bible says in John 3.16, everybody knows John 3.16, for God so loved the world. We get caught up in the affairs of life and the things that go on. And we look at America and the things that are going on in America. We become stressed out. We become worried. We become concerned. Preacher, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think will happen next? Do you think uh, that we'll have excuse me, a recession? Do you think uh, one of the 20 Democrats that are running right now, seems like 20, I don't know if it is or not, one of those guys are going to be, a pre be the president? What if they become a president? The <clears throat> Pelosi said, if we get to be the president, the first thing we're going to see about is taking everybody's guns away from them. Preacher, what do you think will happen if, I don't know, but I know somebody who does know, and I know somebody who is concerned about it. Jesus said this in Matthew, that if a sparrow can fall to the ground without God's notice, without God noticing it, if a sparrow falls to the ground and God doesn't notice it, 
He, he said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his rights, and all these things be added unto you. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow, for the day is sufficient thereof. You say, preacher, aren't you ever concerned about it? Well, sure I am. I'm, I'm concerned about lots of things. But I know somebody who loves me and somebody who will take care of me. Somebody who's taking care of me. Carol and I talk once in a while, every so often, if I can remember her name. No, it's like uh, we talk every once in a while, and, it's, and we, have, we have come to this conclusion that God's taken care of us for the last, this is 2019, for the last 44 plus years. And I don't think he's about to stop now. Listen, there is a God that loves you. And when things, listen, we have been praying for this preacher's wife uh, that has stage three uh, cancer. We've been praying for her. You say, preacher, does God care for her? Well, of course he does. My, my old preacher, the church I was saved in, his son, Tom McKnight, I'm not sure what kind of cancer he has, but he has cancer. You say, was God not concerned about him? Well, sure he is. We often pray for uh, Connie's sister. I, I have her name written down in my, my prayer book. Does not, God not care about her? Well, of course he does. Uh, our, uh, Terry's brother, Wayne. Not that Wayne, but Wayne, you know, Wayne, guy look ZZ top. But uh, that guy, I, I know we know that we prayed about it in church. He was going every couple months for a leukemia checkup because the doc said that he has, he went this Friday and got checked. He didn't have to go back for six months now. You say, well, I guess God cares about him, but he doesn't care about, no. God cares about all of us, and Elijah forgot that even though he had won a great victory at Mount Carmel, even though he, the, the prophets of Baal had been killed, even all that good stuff had happened, he ran and said, God, kill me, because I don't have the nerve to do it myself. And what did God do? Tells us in those verses that he caused him to fall asleep, which is what people do when they're depressed. They, they sleep a lot. And he, gave him, and he woke him up, and he had uh, some some bread bacon on a fire and a cruise of water. God loved him. He ate and he drank it and he fell back asleep again. And then God woke him up again and said, here, arise, take and eat. You got to eat some more. Because he said, the journey is too great for thee. Arise and eat. Listen, brethren, the journey is too great for all of us. There and then, he said, well, I, I do pretty good living a Christian life. No, you don't. Not without God. Not without God. Not without God. Say, once I had my morning coffee. I love my morning coffee. I saw this, a little coffee. And all, I, what I need today is a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. Listen, uh, God loves us. When no one else cared for me, God loved me. And God loves me. And God provides for me. And God will take care of me. Elijah forgot that God loved him so much. Boy, God wrought a great miracle, that's for sure. But now you can't take care of me, God. You don't love me. Here, here, pal. Eat, eat something. Take a nap. Which indicates today that when you go home, you eat lunch, you take a nap. That's probably a good thing, you know. But he says to him, eat this. Take a nap. He woke up. Ate some more. He said, okay, let's go. Come on, let's, let's, let's get back in the fight. Let's, let's get going again. She's not going to kill you. The Bible makes it very clear that nothing can befall us that God does not know about. That if the sparrow falls to the ground, and God knows that, surely God knows about you. And God loves you. May I remind you, Peter said this, I, wanna, I, I know that you know it. I know that you know it. But let me remind you about this. That there is a God in heaven who knows you by name and loves you. I don't know when, when John was little. They call you Johnny when you were little? Yep. They were Johnny. I still call Louie Louie. Is your name Louis? We call him Louis. Nah, Louie. Johnny. Jimmy. I would tell you, I could tell you what my, 
my brother-in-law, who's in heaven, used to call my wife. He couldn't say her name, so he, he would call her something else. Do you know that there's a God in heaven who loves you, and he knows you by name, and he calls you by name? Samuel was in the temple, just a little boy, and God said to Samuel, and Samuel got up and ran over to Eli and said, well, what do you want? Eli said, I didn't call you. So he went back down. God called Samuel again, and he went back over to Eli, and Eli said, uh, I didn't call you. It was either that time or the next time that God called Samuel, and he went, and Samuel said, next time God calls, next time that voice calls you, he said, uh, say, here am I, Lord. God knew Samuel by name. God knows me by name. God loves me. God's concerned about me. You say, well, sometimes things go wrong, preacher. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Doesn't mean that God isn't concerned about you. Things just go wrong in this life. I said last week, and it's true, people say, well, once you get saved, you'll never have another problem. Do people a disservice because we still get sick. We still have problems. Look, our good brother, Arnold. I have known people to call him Arnie. Got stung by the bee and literally died on his front yard. Oh, God must not have cared about him. Oh, God did care about him. My dear friend, God knows you by name. May I remind you again today that there is a God in heaven who loves you and cares about you. Secondly, this, look quickly at, at 1 Samuel. I have four, but we're not going to get to four today. Look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. 2 Samuel. I got it. I've got it written down. 2 Samuel, about chapter 8. 2 Samuel, chapter 8. Uh. You'll remember that what David did, I think it was chapter 9. Yeah, it was chapter 11. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm getting old. That's what it is. 2 Samuel 11. We won't read 2 Samuel chapter 11, but here's the second thing that we need to be reminded of. That God sees what's going on. God knows what's going on. We could talk about Uzzah, maybe we'll get to Uzzah in just a moment, but in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read about David's great sin. David, from what we understand and read about David, David had a problem with women. David had a lot of women in his life. He was married to Michael, he was married to uh, Abigail, he was married to, uh, I think her name was Jezo, Jezo something, it wasn't Jezebel, but he was, he was married to somebody like that. David had many wives. And he was married to Bathsheba. Now, getting married to Bathsheba took some, as, as we know, took some on David's part because, one, he saw her taking a bath, committed adultery with her, got her husband to come home. Uzziah was an honorable man. He got, Uzziah said, look, man, you've done a good job, need a little rest and relaxation, go home, have dinner with your wife, spend a night with your wife, and and Uzziah was such an honorable man, he would not do it. He slept out on the doorstep that night and said, I'm not going in there while my brothers are in the field fighting. And so David got him drunk the next night. Uzziah was still such an honorable man, he would not go into the house, would not have dinner with his wife, would not spend a night with his wife. And so David sent him back, sent a note with him, sent the note by his own hand to Joab and said, when the battle gets the hottest, everybody retreat and leave Uzziah, who the Bible mentions as one of David's 30 great men, Everybody withdraw, leave Uzziah in the front. Uzziah did, gave Joab the note. Joab did as David commanded, and Uzziah was killed. So then David took Bathsheba, and he married her. Now, everything is fine. Everything's good. Nobody knows what went on. The only person who may suspect anything is Joab. Because he had Uzziah, really, David had Uzziah murdered. That's what he did. He had him murdered. 
Nobody knows anything about it. Maybe Joab might have an idea. But God did. God knew all about it. Chapter 11, we read about it. In chapter 12, we read about Nathan who came. And we're, for the sake of time, let me just this. Nathan came, told David a story, kind of a, you know, just a story story, about a guy that had one little lamb. And the family treated that lamb like a pet. The lamb came in, slept with him, ate at the table with him, was just a regular pet. The guy next door had thousands of sheep. The guy next door had a visitor come, so what did he do? Instead of killing one of his sheep, he went over and took that lamb that those people had and killed that lamb, and they ate it. And David became enraged. It's just a story. David became enraged at that and said, that guy that did that's going to pay fourfold. And Nathan just looked at him and said, thou art the man. You're the guy that did that. Bathsheba had one, one husband, Uzziah. David had a lot of wives. And he took the one from Uzziah and had him killed. David's problem was this, and I want to remind you about this, that while nobody else may see, God sees. God knows. God knows what's going on in your life. God knows what's going on in my life. One of the things really that helps me out, and, re and I'm reminded of this, and I, I hope that you're reminded, I want you to remember this, is that sometimes, boy, when we do things wrong, and we do, everybody does things wrong. Sometimes we get mad without reason. Sometimes we get angry without reason. Sometimes we just have a bad day and things aren't going the way that we want. Sometimes we say things that we shouldn't say. Sometimes we act. And I remind you again that Satan puts wrong thoughts, wrong actions, wrong motives, wrong desires in our mind. And all the time we want to blame the devil for it. And I like doing that. But the Bible makes it clear in James chapter 1 about you and I that we conceive a thought in our mind and then we act that thing out. Remember I said last week or two weeks ago, for years... I had, a, I had a serious problem, and I hesitate to say it, but I will. I was very bitter. I was very bitter about something, and I, I would lie in bed at night scheming and conniving on ways to get even. God in heaven saw that. Nobody else saw it. The only people who knew about it was me. Now, you know about it, but the only person who really knew about it was me. I... I I, I tried to think of ways to try to, and you probably, maybe you have, try to get even with people. Somebody does you wrong, somebody says the wrong thing to you, somebody calls you a bad name. I haven't called lots of bad names in my life. What do we do? I'm going to get even with that guy. It's the last thing that I do. And we scheme and connive, and sometimes we take matters into our own hands. Nobody else knows about it. Nobody else sees it. But God does. God does. My thing about God is we want God to bless us. You want God to bless you. I want God to bless me. And, that, and so we say, well, God, I want you to bless me. Oh, God, bless the church. God, bless all the people in the church. God, help everybody in the church to have a good life. We want everybody to have a good life. Uh, help everybody that's sick. We have some sick people in our church. Oh, God, help people who are sick. I believe that God is free to bless us as we seek to obey him. I know that song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And so we... we we say, well, I want God to bless me, but I am not willing to do what God wants me to do. This church. Um, in 1979, 1979 uh, Harold and, and Linda came down to see us in Greg, New York. I mean, in uh, Greg, New York. Yeah, they came to see us in Greg, New York. And uh, we lived in a place called Whiteford, Maryland. Whiteford, Maryland. And Harold and Linda came down and said, uh, we would be interested in you starting a church up there. Would you consider starting a church up there? What, are you kidding me? Up there? 
in that place where it snows. And you've heard me say this. I tell people this. God has a sense of humor. I know he does. Because I told God I wanted to live where it snowed and look where he put me. And so I, they said, you come back up there and start. No, nah, this is what I said. I'll pray about it and see what God would have me to do. You know what I'm doing? I'm still praying about it. I'm still praying about it, what God would have me to do. Because, listen, we want God to bless us. If you want God to bless you, it, and it can be anything. We talk about, like, well, I want God to bless me. Really? Well, the first thing that God would have you to do after you're saved is to get baptized. Well, I'm not going to get baptized. You people believe in dunking them in the river. And I, I remember... One of the sisters back here said when they got saved, they went down to the river, and it was cold in the river. I've seen where they've taken chainsaws and cutting out like a cup, cutting out. They've cut out, it looked like a coffin, because we're being buried, you know, in the ice, down at the river. People get baptized. I'm not going, preacher, if you think I get baptized in the middle of winter down the river, and we don't do that. That's why we got that nice heated baptistry. But people say, well, I'm not going to get baptized. I got baptized once when I was a little baby. Well, so did I. I got randized. That's what sprinkle means. I got randized. I was sprinkled. I didn't get baptized. People say, well, I, I, I understand what you're saying, preacher. I, I have had people say to me in church here, I've had them say to me, well, I understand that I need to get baptized and and I think I will get baptized one day. Until you do what you know to do, God's not free to bless you. And God sees. Well, God knows I want to get baptized. I just, you know, haven't. God sees. David forgot the fact that God sees. Let me give you this. I won't even take much time with it. I'll just say this. Elijah forgot that God loved him. David forgot that God sees, and God does see. God sees us in all of our circumstances. Uzziah, Uzzah, Uzziah, Uzzah, it's Uzzah, Uzziah, Uzziah, and, and Samuel, Uzzah, and, and Chronicles. You remember the account about what happened. David was moving the Ark of the Covenant. Now, according to what Genesis, Exodus According to what Exodus and Leviticus says, they were to make the Ark of the Covenant. They were to put two rings. The Ark was about the size of this table. It had cherubims over the top of it. There was a, it was overlaid totally in gold. Uh, there was a cabinet. It wasn't open like this. It was about this size. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, or the, the tables of stone. There was Aaron's rod that budded. You say, well, what was that? Well, the 12 tribes, who's going to be the priestly tribe? Each tribe cut a stick, and they threw it down the next morning. Aaron's rod, it was a stick, it was dead. Aaron's rod had literally budded. So the tribe of Levi was going to be that. That stick was in there, and there was a pot of manna on the inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Over top were two cherubims. It's, it's not, they looked at one another. It's not clear whether or not they actually touched some some artist's conception of it is that their wings literally came over and touched one another. In the middle was the mercy seat where they sprinkled the blood. It was a holy thing. There were rings, a round ring on this side, round ring there, there, and there. They were to carry them with, with staves, sticks, overlaid with gold. They were to carry them. David had the Ark of the Covenant, and he's bringing it back. And so David says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a brand new cart out of fresh wood for God. I'm going to put the Ark of the Covenant on that, and I'm going to bring it back to town with, I'll have two oxen pull it, and we're going to bring it, bring it to its right place. There were two guys, and one was Uzziah. Not, not Uzziah, but Uzzah. And he's following along beside it. And... The oxen hit a bump or something, and the cart moved. And Uzzah stuck out his hand to steady it. And you remember what happened. God struck him dead right there. 
So I said, well, that wasn't fair. But wait a minute. You see, God has a way to do things. God has a way. God's ways are not always our ways. And Uzzah thought he was doing something right. He had the idea, oh, I'm going to do this my way. I realized God said, don't touch it, but I don't think God would be too upset if I steadied it to keep it from falling. Now, they were doing it the wrong way. It was not to be carried on a cart. It was not to be drawn by some oxen. It was to be carried by four men. But David said, I think I'll just do it the way I want. I'll do that the way I want. Uzzah said, you know what I'll do? I'll just reach out. That thing about, looks like it's about to fall out. I'll reach out and steady it. And God killed him. Here's what we forget. Uzzah, Uzzah decided he was going to do it his way and not God's way. Because God has a way. God's ways are not always our way. People say, well, you know what? I can, I can live the Christian life. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to pray. I don't really need to go to church. I don't, I don't need to do all that. Well, wait a minute. That isn't what God says. And we could go through the Bible. There are so many things that God says. And can, can I remind you just one that John wrote about? And is either second or third John. He said, here's, here's a commandment. Here's a commandment. It's not a new commandment. Kind of an old commandment. But it's new. And he said, this is what it is. This is the commandment that I give you. That you love one another. That you love one another. Here's what Jesus said. Hereby will all men know that you're my disciples. If you love one another. Paul makes it clear that in, a, in any church, I'm not talking about necessarily us, but in any church, he said where there's envying and fighting and strife, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, there's envying and fighting and strife? Are you not carnal? God's way is the best way when we love one another. We're out of time. There's so many things we could be reminded of. Elijah forgot that God loved him. David forgot that God sees him. And Uzziah forgot that God has his way. And God's way is not always our way. Peter said, I want to stir up you up. I want you to be reminded of this. People say, well, oh, preacher, I, I know that. Really? 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 If I were to ask you, I said, what was my sermon about two weeks ago? Mm. What was my sermon about last week? Mm. What? We'll forget 90% of what we hear this morning. Well, I remember the joke preacher about the two guys, you know, blah, blah. But that's not the thing that we want to be reminded about. We need to be remembered. We need to be reminded there is a God that loves you. There is a God that sees you, and there is a God that's got his way, and his way is the right way. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for another opportunity today, Lord. I don't know where time went today, but it sure went. Lord, I thank you for each one of my brothers and sisters in Christ today, Lord. I'm glad that they came. I'm glad that they're here. Lord, just want to remind them today again about some simple truths that we need to bring to our attention again, that God, you love us, and you care about us, that God, you see us, you know what's going on in our lives, and Lord, you've got a way, God's way, it ought to be our way. Father, I pray for every believer, every single person this morning, help us to be reminded they're simple truths, and we probably know them. But, Lord, we need, to, we need to be reminded of them. Father, I pray again for every person. Lord, maybe somebody's here today that's never experienced the love of God in their life. Maybe somebody watching, Lord, never doesn't know what it means to be saved. Father, I pray again today that you would, Lord, and press upon people. Press upon, upon folks. Lord, Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say it was one of the many ways. He said he was the way that leads to eternal life. Lord, lots of people got lots of ideas about how to go to heaven, but 
as we said, God's got a way, and his way is what's right. Lord, your way to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, it's kind of a simple thing, but how many people just refuse to do it? Lord, I pray again for every single person here, Lord. Again, meet the need of their heart. Lord, give us safety as we go home. Watch over us, we pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'll ask this quickly. Is there anyone here today say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I know our time's gone. Thank you for being patient again. Uh, Preacher, I'm not sure I would go to heaven. I, I want to be sure. I, I do. I want to be sure about it. Preacher, would you pray for me? Nobody looking. Preacher, would you pray for me today that I might know for sure I'd go to heaven when I die? Jesus said that we might know that we have. John said, 1 John 5, 13, that you may know that you have everlasting life, eternal life, eternal life. There's a difference between living forever and eternal life. Anyone today, preacher, would you pray for me before you close? I might know I have eternal life once, twice. Father, thank you again. Lord bless, we pray as we go. Give traveling mercies. Bring us back tonight, we pray that we might rejoice together. Lord in church, Lord, that we might have a good time of fellowship together. Lord, I thank you for all my brothers and sisters in Christ today. And Lord, I pray that you, Lord, again, meet the need of their heart. Bless us as we go. Help us to be reminded of these three simple truths, Lord. I know that we know them, but, Lord, that we might be stirred up. Help us be reminded the journey is too great for us to go up by ourselves. Now, Lord, bless, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.